Breaking news from Iran. The Shah, the king or monarch of Iran, has signed a firman dismissing Prime Minister Mossadegh and naming Zahidi to replace him. Currently, there is rioting in front of Mossadegh's house, and it looks like Iran is about to go through a change that will reshape the whole country. But first, let's take a step back and see what led us to this Razaz coup in 1953. This all boils down to the root of the problem, oil. The Anglo-Persian Oil Company was created by the British in order to take control of the oil exportation in Iran. The British has built up the city of Abadan with power generating stations, workshops, water filtration plants, and a small railway. Iranians were treated as second-class citizens and had inhumane working conditions while the British lived like royalty. Wait, that's not cool. The British were such bullies. Yeah. That's what the Iranians thought too, especially Mohammad Mossadegh. Mossadegh was a Razaz man, especially if you were talking about his influence in the nationalization of oil. In the 1940s, he recognized the unfair treatment of Iranians and decided he needed to do something. Mossadegh and several other nationalist leaders created the National Front. A few of them, including Mossadegh, were elected into the mod Modulus, Iran's 200-seat parliament. There, they began to gain support and spread their ideas about Iran needing to nationalize its oil. On a meeting held on November 25th about oil, Mossadegh announced his hatred of the supplemental agreement and his support of the nationalization of the seemingly radical idea. So hold on, the supplemental agreement offered improvements from the initial agreement between the Iranians and the British, right? Yes. The supplemental agreement gave the Iran Iranian government more money, but didn't give the Ar Iranians any power in management. Mossadegh believed this wasn't a good agreement, and he argued against it. Once he finally convinced Iran that nationalization of oil is what needed to be done, he became a national hero. He basically saved Iran. This is why he was elected in the first free election in 1951. Well, the British weren't too happy about that. Their initial reaction was to set an economic sanction on August 22nd on Iran, prohibiting the export of British goods like sugar and steel. They were so mad, in fact, that they drew up plans to invade and occupy Iran. The Iranian government found out about this and kicked the British out. Oh no, what are the British going to do now? Well, they decided they needed the help of people who were still in Iran. Their closest ally was America. The president in power at the time was President Truman. Unfortunately for the British, Truman did not support their plans. He believed that it was too dangerous of a move because if their plan failed, Iran would turn to the Soviets and further spread communism, which was definitely not what the U.S. wanted. In 1953, Eisenhower, nicknamed Ike, came into presidency. Unlike Truman, he supported the British in their plan to overthrow Iran's current government. This was the last piece in the puzzle for Prime Minister Churchill's plan to overthrow the government. Now, it was go time. The coup d'etat, the plan for the U.S. and Britain to overthrow Mossadegh and put Zahidi into power, now had its final piece in place. The recently created Central Intelligence Agency of the United States was a key part of the plan. The CIA dealt with national security and their agents led the mission, known as Operation Ajax. This was the joint mission of the U.S. and Britain to overthrow the Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. There were three important people a part of Operation Ajax. The first two were the Dulles brothers, John Foster and Allen. John Foster Dulles was the Secretary of State under President Eisenhower. His main focus was to stop communism. The second brother, Allen, was the Director of Central Intelligence. Wait! Fun, fun time. time! Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., which many of us have flown through, was named after John Foster Dulles. This just shows you how big of an influence he made. That's right, Michaela. Another key player in this was Kermit Roosevelt. He was a political action officer of the CIA and helped coordinate Operation Ajax. After a lot of planning, it was finally the day of the coup. Everything seemed to be going as planned. There were protests in the streets against Mossadegh, and many others were being bribed. The U.S. and the British thought this was great. The more people that they had on their side, the better, right? Wrong. 
This was their downfall. Too many people knew about their plan, and Mossadegh was warned about the coup. This was a disappointment for the British and the Americans. Many wanted to give up and call it a day, but Kermit said no. So what did they do next? Well, Mackenzie, Kermit sprung into action. First, they redistributed Furmans to the city and to southern towns where mobs were recruited. The Furmans were decrees that were signed by the Shah approving the replacement of Mohammed Mossadegh with Sahidi. Say so what? I know, but these Furmans were key to the overthrow. Although they were used in the first attempt, this time they were also sent through the town and to news agencies. At the start of the second attempt, the CIA sent out destructive mobs known as black crabs that were told to run through the streets declaring their loyalty to Mossadegh and to communism. Mossadegh, trying to prove his support of democracy, allowed them to continue in their harmful protests. But this was all a trick. American Ambassador Hand Henderson met with Mossadegh to discuss the anti-American phone calls they were receiving. The um, ambassador had made this all up, and he was just trying to put Mossadegh in a bad light. The gullible prime minister felt sorry for the Americans and decided to tell the mobs to get off the street. <sighs> this is exactly what the Americans wanted. This backfired on Mossadegh because one, it made him look too controlling and anti-democratic, and two, it made his supporters stay home on the day of the coup because they didn't want to disobey him. With the fire, the Furman spread, Mossadegh being shown in a bad light, and people being paid to be ready for the coup, everything was just where it needed to be. Well, the Razaz day of the coup is finally here. It's coup time! Fazola Zahidi, scheduled to take over as prime minister after the coup, was patiently awaiting the news of how everything was going. Back in Washington, many were opposed to the idea of a second attempt but Kermit was still going strong. Kermit decided to put everything into action, and just like that, the coup was in play. Bodybuilders, circus people, and gangs who had been paid by the CIA were out in the streets getting everyone riled up. Tehran was complete chaos. Eventually, the crowd stormed inside Mossadegh's house, but Mossadegh was able to escape. Just in the nick of time. The radio stations declared Mossadegh's decline, and now the coup was official. So what now? The Shah was not going to go easy on Mossadegh and all of his supporters. After Mossadegh returned, he was put on trial and found guilty of treason and given a sentence of three years in jail and a life sentence of house arrest. His ideas of secularism died out with his decline and religion was again a large part of the government and ideals of Iran. He lived the rest of his life peacefully and eventually died from throat cancer. Following the coup, Mohammad Reza Shah not only exiled Mossadegh, but created the Savak. This organization is similar to the U.S.'s CIA and used torture on Mossadegh's supporters. It sounds like things got crazy. Yes, things got very crazy. People eventually got tired of Mohammad Reza Shah's dictatorial ways and decided they needed to do something about it. So from 1978 to 1979, the people overthrew him in the Iranian Revolution. This upset the U.S. and Britain because their hard work now meant nothing. This was the cause of much tension between the opposing sides. Following the Iranian Revolution that cooed the coup, Iran has become America's enemy rather than ally. Currently, there are talks going on between the P5 plus one, or the permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany. Wait! Time. The permanent members of the Security Council are China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. All of these countries are key components of any decision that has to be made. The P5 plus one is trying to negotiate with Iran to keep them from enriching their uranium over 20%, which could lead to atomic bombs. We are currently nearing November 7th and 8th, which is when the nuclear talks will take place. This could be a day of great compromise or horrible loss. Mohammad Zarif, who is Iran's lead negotiator, has a lot to deal with nearing these states. Iran wants to abolish all sanctions. 
But the U.S. doesn't believe in their change of political system. America also wants Hezbollah to become an exclusively political and social organization and acceptance of the two-state approach. The U.S. and Iran want very different things, so a compromise will be hard, but not impossible. Iran's history, America and Britain's involvement with the coup, and the Iranian Revolution are all key factors in America and Iran's relationship today. We'll see how the negotiations go. Keep updated with November 7th and November 8th. Thanks, Thanks for watching! watching.